Will everyone please stand? Put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United, the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under nation under God, under God, liberty for just all, with liberty and justice for all. Um, we had a close session uh, prior to this, and no reportable action was taken. Uh, Dr. Tarostian, is there um, any change in order of business? There is not. I'll entertain a motion for the approval of the minutes of the May 13th meeting, please. Second, uh, motion. Seconded. Second. Thank you, Celine. Second. Is there any discussion? Ms. Huff, may we please have a vote? Board Member Gilliland? Yes. Board Member Lockerbie? Yes. Did you hear my yes? I did, yeah, thank you. Board Member Travanti? Yes. Board Member Wong? Yes. Board President Hammond? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Um, thank you. Um, are our student uh, board members here? They are not. Okay. We will be sending a letter of thanks to Ashley Mendez um, and Valerie Hernandez uh, from Monrovia High School and from Canyon Oaks Mountain Park, thanking them for their service. They had an uh, abbreviated year of being a board member. But the time that they were here, it was very much appreciated. So we'll be sending along a certificate. Thanks for that. Uh, this is the time of year where we are, it's sad because a number of people that have spent a considerable amount of time um, giving it all to our district are now retiring. And uh, is it going to be Dr. Jackson who is going to be making the introductions of the people who are going to be retiring? Sure. Darvin, is that you? That is, yes, it is. That is yes, it is. Board President Hammond, members of the board, Dr. Tarosian, members of cabinet and the community. This is Dr. Jackson, Assistant Superintendent, Human Resources. It gives me great pleasure to have the Board of Education wish to honor those Monrovia Unified School District employees who have retired or be, will be retiring uh, this school year, uh, being that we're operating in this distance platform, I'd just like to uh, read off the names here, even though they're here um, in the board minutes. Um, this is Ophelia Barajas, who has served as our uh, special day class teacher, who has also joined us this evening, has served at Monrovia High School for 15 years. Renee Dankin, Kinder Instructional Aide, Brad Oaks for 40 plus years. Gloria Rico, teacher at Plymouth Elementary School, 16 years. Janelle Johnson, our health assistant, too, at Plymouth, three years. Sylvia Martinez, instructional aide, severe disability, Mayflower Elementary School, six years. Sal Perez, ceramics teacher, Monrovia High School, 34 years. May CC, our special day class teacher at CLC, 16 years. Marilyn Smith, math teacher at Clifton Middle School, 34 years. Dolores Quintero, food service worker. Monrovia High School, 39 years. And Donna Wheeler, food service worker, M Monrovia High School, uh, 23 years. I'd like to just say a, a few more words um, in taking this moment to acknowledge the classified and certificate, certificated staff who are transitioning to their golden years. The individuals on the 2020 retiree list have either made my acquaintance, worked alongside me, and in some cases have worked with my daughter. Each one of them has provided a caring, thoughtful, and nurturing environment for the many students who have passed through the Monrovia Unified School District hallways. I want to thank them for the many hours that they have spent creating better students, better people, and most importantly, better citizens during their tenure in the Monrovia Unified School District. Whether it has been six years or 39 years of service, the families of Monrovia are all better as a, re as a result of their service. And we will 
forever be in their debt. Thank you, Board mm -hmm. President Hammond, for allowing me that time. You're welcome. Um, from the board, thank each and every one of you for the commitment that you made to serve our students in the community. It, you truly made a difference. And on a personal side, there's a few here of people who I will dearly miss. And I hope that you have as exciting time in retirement as you did in your chosen career and profession. Thank you so very, very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mrs. Smith, are you here? Well, if Mrs. Smith um, is watching this a little bit later, these, uh, these two just found out that their math teacher will be retiring. And um, there are some tears here, tears, tears of joy and, and tears of, of, of sadness. No tears here. <laughs> So we're going to um, miss all of you so much and um, several of the people that you mentioned that are retiring have, have known, 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 known the Lockerbie. So we're so grateful to all of you and we wish you the best. And I'd like to give a shout out to uh, South Perez. I want to give a shout out to every one of these teachers that have given us so many years of great service and we have such great staff such great teachers and, and uh, it's hard to see them retire sometime. But a special shout out to Sal Perez who taught, uh, I think all three of my uh, stepchildren as they went through Monrovia High School. And Sal made ceramics more than just, more than just an arts program. Uh, Sal showed the students how they could uh, uh, get into the commercial aspects of ceramics. And I believe that there are several people that are making a profession out of that and uh, certainly has helped uh, me and many in this community see uh, the value of the arts and those programs and how, especially in Los Angeles County, that those arts are so important, not only just from a, 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 an aesthetic standpoint, but also from the commercial aspect. And uh, Sal, we're gonna miss you. I'd like to also um, add, if I could, congratulations to you all. Um, I'm just looking at the number of years on the agenda um, and uh, what Mr. Hammond said earlier is, is, is that there's a lot of experience there and a lot of love and nurturing that you all have given to our students along the years. Um, just like Ms. Lockerbie, my daughter was uh, personally touched by Ms. Smith and um, She's a great math teacher, and, and I'm, I'm wishing you all well in your retirement. And it's probably a really great time to just relax and kick back and um, eventually get to go out and enjoy um, outdoor activities as well. But I wish you all well and a wonderful retirement. And although if we were in person, we'd be clapping and we'd be handing you certificates. Um, I'm assuming they're in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> but um, just take this virtual clap, if you will. Uh, congratulations to you all, and thank you for your service. Thank you very much. And President, you, if I may just uh, thank them for their service, their time, their expertise. Uh, collectively, they have touched the lives of thousands of Monrovia's kids, and their legacy continues. I am just so proud to have been able to work alongside some of them, get to know them. Uh, they really part, are part of the fabric and it is a loss for us. So congratulations and best wishes on your journey. Thank you. And I look and forward to inviting you to the boardroom one day where we can actually celebrate, applaud, and even perhaps hug. <laughs> well, I'll actually be in Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> oh, congratulations. Well, we can come to you. Yes, I'm moving to Arizona. I'm moving back to where my grandmother was born. Yes. Oh, wow. So, thank you all very much and Thanks enjoy your day. Good luck to you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you for Peace being day. here. That's always the sad time of year when this part comes up. So many friends and co workers and fantastic people. This is over 200 years of service that's retiring. 
it's amazing. Um, thank you all again so very, very much. Uh, board member reports. Um, I'm the only one with a report and mine is very short. I'd like to thank uh, Supervisor Catherine Barger. Um, as you all know now, um, our, our graduation at Monrovia High School and at Canyon, Park, uh, Canyon Oaks Mountain Park will proceed as planned. And uh, I appreciate, we appreciate uh, all of her efforts to help us get us our graduation back on track. Very, very much appreciated. Um, we have no student board member report. And then uh, next up is a report from superintendent, Dr. Carosi. Thank you, President Hammond, members of the board. I echo your uh, words of gratitude to Supervisor Barger, as well as to uh, the city of Monrovia, the city manager, the chief of police. They have been stalwart in their uh, support of us and will be working alongside us to make sure that we have healthy, safe uh, graduations and promotion events with uh, minimal disruption to the community and uh, reminding everybody to uh, continue to make safe, healthy uh, choices and decisions uh, during the ceremonies and of course, afterwards. Uh, we are living in, in difficult times and uh, letting our guard down even for a moment is may have some consequences. So uh, enjoy and uh, hopefully we'll be able to enjoy a little more uh, cavalier manner in the future. Thank you, uh, President Henry. Thank you. Up next, we have public comment. Uh, Ms. Hupp, do we have anybody who wishes to speak on any item that is on the, uh, is on the agenda? There are none. Uh, how about anybody who wishes to speak on any item not on the agenda? There are none. We'll close that portion of the meeting and we'll move to informational reports and presentation. Uh, Ms. Wu, may we please have an update on the Governor's May Revised. Yeah. Um, good evening, Board of President Ms. Hammond, Board of Education, Superintendent Dr. Torosian, Cabinet, and the committee members. And um, as some of you may recall that uh, on the Governor Newsom, he released the state budget, also called the May Revision, on May 14. That May Revision is the last steps for the state to adopt its budget, which the duty is June 15. The state May Revision so based on the uh, data of the collection for the individual income tax revenue, which come up with 77% of state revenue, we anticipate that change will happen um, after July 15. Next slide, please. So um, next two slides will explain why from governor's uh, preliminary budget from January and it changed to the May revision. So um, COVID-19 pandemic impact uh, the everybody, basically shutting home, the business closed, the retail store closed, a lot of, a lot of people lose their jobs. This slide shows that from 2018 to 2020, in the uh, last uh, um, over uh, years, the unemployment numbers skyrocketed from 7,440 to 23, over 23,000. Next slide, please. This slide also um, demonstrate the changes from the gross domestic product um, from different quarters in the last couple of years. And the second quarter from this year, which is starting the March, exactly the uh, various shouting home order released from the various government agency. You can tell that it's uh, the, the red bar is uh, so deep and compared with the rest of the quarters. Next slide, please. Next two so, slide will explain why from governor's uh, preliminary budget from January and it changed to the May revision. So, um, <laughs> Okay, sorry, we have a technical problem here. Yeah. Okay. Is that um, you? No, it's not me. It looks like record, a record. So I'm going to continue if everybody okay.
So um, this slide lists the impact for the um, major state called Big Three uh, income tax. The state heavily rely on uh, three uh, taxes from sales and use tax, personal income tax, and the corporate tax in the second quarter starting March and compared with the January uh, budget, uh, um, um, budget, uh, preliminary budget release. And it, you can tell on average is 20% decrease. Next slide, please. So this is a comparison uh, for the January budget release versus the May revision. And you can tell that uh, the 1819, we have a little bit of uh, good news. And from 1920, 2021, as of May revision, the state of revenue and jobs uh, from both years. Next slide, please. So um, because of the state revenue decrease and the state implement uh, the 10% cut for the local control funding formula, which is the major operation um, revenue the district depend on from the states. So what the, um, here, this slide, I list the detail calculation, which means that the state um, from the 1920 based Grant, uh, grant, um, base grant, uh, um, base uh, grant for the LCFF per ADA, and the state add on the 2.31% for the calculated quota. This is the, uh, the mathematical formula. And, and then after that, it become this, uh, the next year's base per ADA. Then they take a flat 10% reduction. So after 10% reduction, the effective 2021 base grant per ADA, for example, K23 is $7,022. This $7,022 equivalent to 7.92% decrease compared with the 1920 school year base grant. So each of um, the grace bands uh, um, calculated the 2021 base grant per ADA use this uh, um, process. Next slide, please. So as the board recall that uh, the district uh, mm, present the board, the board approved for the second intern report is based on the January preliminary um, budget. So at that time, we projected that next year's revenue is 52.3 million and 21-22 is 53.4 million. However, the story has been changed because of a 10% across the board cut. So uh, in also projected the uh, decline enrollment, we are facing next school year for the LCFF funding from state, we're facing $5.2 million reduction for the 2021 and another over $6.5 million reduction for 21-22. Uh, this uh, reduction also the, the 5.2 and the 6.5 also including the supplemental on the concentrations. Next slide, please. So not only the LCFF will get a 10% um, um, cut, and the state also proposed that a major category program will be subject to 50% um, cut. So here is the example of some categorical program we're facing the budget cut. And those program is also impact district. The dollar amount I list here is statewide reduction. For example, adult education program, the statewide is $66.7 million reduction, and it will impact our program too. But the detailed impact for our program was, uh, we're still to, um, to see. And the two um, CTE program, and we have the um, career technical education incentive grant, that grant also facing the um, cut for the after school education uh, after school education and the safety program, program which is our village program was funded the statewide were facing 100 million dollar cut so we're still uh, waiting for our piece of the reduction next slide please so this um, graphic uh, presents the uh, the board the board has uh, recalled that back to a great recession the state the first thing the state do in, in address the cash shortage is deferral. So the deferral will implement starting next uh, month, which means that the statewide uh, 1.87 billion will be deferred from um, June to July, which means that 
the state were not funding um, any uh, LCF money to the school district. But as you know that the school district has our obligation to pay our employee as well as our bills. The most challenging is uh, the end of the next school year, which is uh, in April, May, and June. And it looks like each of these three months, the state proposed to defer their cash payment um, to either July or further. So um, this will definitely impact our operation and uh, we are plan to um, join the trend as we did before to borrow the money to make sure that uh, and the district meet our um, payment obligations. Next slide, please. So um, but, um, out of all of this kind of, there is some um, light at the end of the tunnel, which means that uh, the, the district has received uh, the SB 117 um, COVID-19 uh, response funding, which is a little bit shy for $90,000. The, the county already uh, sent the district money. And also the federal care money, which is also COVID related uh, um, funding, which is the one time to help the district to uh, absorb additional costs due to, uh, from the dist uh, distant learnings and the supplies and the, the um, computer uh, devices. Um, this funding, the district do need to apply and they are, I think the apply will uh, start in July 1st. The special ed looks like, although the special ed is still facing the um, campus and cut, and, and the state did commit to increase our base rate per a day up to $645. So um, we welcome that news. It will help uh, the district general fund uh, reduce the encroachment. Next slide, please. So the other flexibility the state helped the district in order to adjust uh, this 10% uh, cut it is the pension plan. So the state um, decreased our district contribution to both our stores and purse um, percentage around, around uh, 2%. So this will reduce our budget for the car stores and car purse accordingly in the, in the next two years. I list here the detail um, dollar amount. And it also is the routine restrict maintenance. Routine restrict maintenance is uh, the if the district receives state facility funding, we are required that set the 3% currently aside to adjust the uh, district facility use. But also the state gave us a flexibility. They, um, in the calculation for the 3%, the state allows us ex excluding the uh, employer, part of employer contribution. So that will reduce our uh, budget um, for the 100, um, over a little bit over $115,000. Next slide, please. So um, as a scheduled, um, our next board meeting, um, the district will submit the board for approval for adopt the 2021 budget. And uh, uh, we will uh, again present uh, another um, budget, um, budget presentation and then we'll show more detail, including the, the multi-year um, projections. And the next is about the tax board adoption. I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Kaiser, our assistant superintendent um, of education service, um, give the board some information about our status. Good evening, board president Hammond and board. In terms of textbooks, um, we are looking at deferring all textbook adoptions and purchases in, indefinitely until the budget can support our purchases of textbooks. In February 2020, the um, board approved the, the purchase of grades six through 12 social science. That will be our last piece that we'll bring up for adoption until we have the, the funds to go forward with adoptions. And so the adoptions are put on hold right now. The first one is science, um, K-12, so um, history, social science, grades K-5. And then in the future, in a couple of years from now, we would be set to start looking at mathematics again. And so again, these will be put on hold. We will be using the materials that we have along with open source materials where there are gaps between what we have and what the 
next generation science standards would indicate or um, what any of the, the new standard pieces would call for. So we will be assisting our teachers in, de, in plugging in in our pacing calendars lessons that would address the, the standards that are being added. So um, as we we'll recall that when economy uh, go to south and uh, we have experienced that uh, a lot of uh, um, private school students, they transfer to the public sector. And as of right now, the, um, as the, I am um, aware that at least two students transfer to MHS. So it is time for all for the district and the principals continue promote our school, continue pro promote our wonderful program. What happened in the uh, Monrovia Unified School District? Um, hopefully, that uh, um, we can catch some of the family who decided to uh, move their kids to enroll the uh, public school, and we welcome to them to come to Monrovia Unified School District. And we're also starting the um, conversation with our association in regarding of the health and welfare um, contribution. Uh, the district did not budget uh, any increase uh, for the 2021 health insurance increase because as a, a contract language, any district increase contribution is subject to the negotiation. Uh, we also uh, look at uh, the, um, the budget, uh, potential area for budget re reduction. The first area is that we're, we're close to monitor the district-wide additional assignment extra hours and uh, overtime um, cost. We also uh, um, um, look at uh, the travel and uh, um, conference, try to minimize, uh, although we pro promoted the employee um, professional development, but we try to um, reduce the unnecessary and including the number of the employee participants specific um, conference. And also we um, supplies, we try to focus on the on supply to uh, support our um, instructions. So um, the the district um, by ed code, we are required to uh, revise our budget um, within the 45 days after state um, adopt its budget. That will be conclude my presentation. Um, this is for the 2021 um, board uh, board adoption, the budget and the part one. So um, I will present part two in a, on June 10th board meeting. Any question from the board and the community about the board, uh, the May revision? Any questions of Connie? Um, I have a question actually of uh, first of Dr. Kaiser. Dr. Kaiser, are you still here? Yes. Hi. Um, when you were talking about on this last slide, um, when you were talking about textbook book adoption and how um, the social science is the last textbook that we're going that we've we've adopted that we're not going to adopt any right now because of the um, budget difficulties you said that we're going to be um, supplementing from other places to fill in the gaps to um, fill the requirements um, i'm paraphrasing you there do you know yet what state testing is going to look like because we can't be the only district that is delaying new textbook adoption and that is having to supplement. And um, I, do you know yet if they are going, how the testing is going to go next year because of all of these, these issues and, and what the uh, standards are going to be, if the standards are gonna change and if the testing is going to change. Um, in terms of the standards, the mathematics materials that we're using and the ELA, it, the, the language arts is relatively new. We're still within the umbrella of the adoption years and it matches our standards perfectly, as does our mathematics. The one that um, where the standards have changed and we're playing catch up is the science. And teachers have actually been working for the last three years on next generation science standards, developing lessons and units. Um, and in fact, I was on a county call with all of the assistant soups from the entire county talking about science the other day. And we did a poll of the county um, representatives that were on the call. None of the districts are adopting science. And the, um, the representative, the consultant that works with the county in the area of science, who is the expert, he is going to be giving resources and some assistance in terms of guiding us toward um, 
filling in some of those gaps. And our teachers are have a, we're a little bit ahead of the curve with next generation science when we have the I am science project that was funded. Mm -hmm. um, it was that multi-million dollar grant for teacher training and we, we received training from UCLA for three years. Um, and so our teachers were a little bit ahead of the curve in terms of understanding next generation science, and they've already been working on that. So that's one part of your question. The other part has to do with testing. The testing already has started for science. And so we do know what it looks like. Um, this year, of course, there is no state testing, but for the past two years, we were in test pilots and then we were in the first years of implementation for science already. So yes, um, in answer to your question, we do know what those tests require. We do have samples to look at for our teachers so that they can prepare our students to hit the targets that are required. So in preparation for hitting the target, the books that we have now, the science books that we have now, the science curricula that we have now, does it need, is it, is it outdated or is it new? It, is it something that needs to be um, significantly um, supplemented? It needs some supplementing. Um, fortunately, science principles don't change much. And so the things that students learn in science, you know, especially as they go through chemistry and biology, but the high school rigors of science, those things really don't change much. What had changed was the delivery and the critical thinking that is wrapped around science. And that's where the professional development came in, in terms of helping our teachers to see how to balance their science um, curricula so that they're they're delivering um, information which is factoid in nature. And then at the same time, they're teaching children and students how to manipulate the facts and manipulate that information for um, creating determinations and for um, going through the scientific process and for doing the explorations. There's a great deal of exploration that is encouraged and required in the next generation science standards. So there is some supplementing that needs to go on. So yes. Mm -hmm. um, may I ask another question, uh, President Hammond? Absolutely. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Kaiser. Ms. Huff, could you go back to the slide that has the um, colored arrows on it um, for, it was the May, re mm, that one, thank you. So Ms. Wu, I just wanted to clarify. So above the line, that's the governor's January projection. And below the line is the May revision. So when we're looking at 2020-2021, governor's January state budget projection of 84 billion, that's for the state, right? That's correct. So that 84 billion was the governor's projection back in January of 2021's budget. Is that correct? That's correct. In the January 2020, and the governor projected in the 2021 school year, the state will be have $84 billion. But then in the May, re this May's revision, his revision of 20, January 2021's um, January budget is reduced by $14 billion. That's his projection as of this May for- Yeah, as of this May for next school year. And the, the, the uh, next school year, it will um, drop from 84 original projection to, uh, to 70.5 billion. Okay. Just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any question board? Any other questions? Brian. Um, I know this is the preliminary and this is uh, going to change dramatically by the time we finalize things, but clearly um, there's gonna be some hardship here. And in this budget, 
uh, although you mentioned where we might be getting some additional funding, um, one-time money, we didn't really cover or you didn't address what the additional expenses are that we are going to incur uh, from the coming school years. Now, I, I understand that we don't know yet what a classroom day is going to look like per se at this point. But if we were to open up uh, like a regular school year, clearly we're gonna have additional expenses for cleaning and, and masks and thermometers and so forth. Have we estimated what the expense of this virus is going to be to us? So, um, Brian, that will be my part two. So, um, you, you bring a good, a good point. That's the reason why, because we know that revenue, as of, as of right now, revenue will be decreased. So, my part two, um, I will present the board, the, the detailed expenditure, each, each section, what is will be look like. And uh, we, uh, we already purchased a, a lot of uh, safety ready supply. And we will continue, just like you mentioned, that we'll pre prepare the social distancing when school reopening. We will include the um, anticipated cost um, in, in the part two projections, uh, part two presentations. Okay. Based on where things are at today, if I understood the, the governor's uh, budget, they still are including a over 2% COLA, positive COLA, is that correct? Uh, that's correct. They basically, COLA is uh, um, calculated, but it doesn't mean that they will fund us. So that's why we say that we will calculate the COLA for next year is 2.31, but we will not give you. Instead of we'll not give you, we will give you 10% cut. So that is the slide I showed uh, step by step. Uh, step. Um, so, um, do you want to take a look at that or you're okay? Well, th this is clearly going to change. And, and yeah. the point that I want people to understand um, is th these are some of the games that they're going to play to make it sound like they're not cutting a lot when in reality our bottom line is going to get whacked. So they're going to say we're going to give you a 10% cut and we're going to pay for a 2% COLA well, that call is never going to materialize because it can't. And there's going to be a number of these type of items. Uh, our borrowing costs are not included on this because uh, although they're going to start giving us IOUs like they have in the past, we still need to pay our bills today. So I, I haven't seen what those borrowing costs are going to be. Um, just e even assuming things did not get worse, which I'm not going to make that assumption, but just by the numbers that we have here on the surface, we're going to be short $5 million this year and $6 million next year, an additional $6 million next year, right? So I know you don't have a multi-year projection, but just doing the back of the napkin, we're going to be about $18 million in the hole on our third year out, if not more. Is that correct? That's correct, Brian. And uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, um, you know, you, um, I'm, I think you probably just did it through on the napkin. Um, the other, on the other hand, uh, Brian, we are not alone. So I anticipate that I can't wait to see um, what school district still can survive with such severe <laughs> I think majority of school districts will not. And uh, Monrovia, we're not the worst. Um, I only talked to School Service California. They only sh in, in, ensure me that county, Monrovia, definitely not um, the worst. We have more school districts in a much worse position than us financially. But it is our responsibility, also the uh, board responsibility, make sure that uh, um, we need to balance our budget. It will be very tough to um, balance the budget with the $11 million cut. But we will uh, I, I, best to do our job. You know, Connie, I, I don't think it, I don't think the question is whether Monrovia is one of the worst. Uh, I'm willing to bet that we're one of the best. You know, th this board over the years has been very conscious of not bowing to any individual spot uh, issue and looking for long-term planning. 
we have been very fiscally responsible uh, over the years. And this is where, you know, as they say, uh, the tide's going to come out and you're going to see who, who's wearing a bathing suit or not. Uh, and I'm comfortable we have one on. But, but just looking at these numbers, these numbers are, are absolutely scary. Uh, our third year out, there is a strong potential out of a budget of $50 million, we're going to be short $18 million. Those numbers are very sobering. Uh, and, and I need people to know and understand today uh, what this means, because we don't plan for one month at a time, two months at a time. We plan for three years at a time, and they have lasting impacts. And, and I'm, I'm very concerned since we don't know what this next year is going to look like, um, that we have to start identifying where some of these weak spots are going to be because we need to start lobbying today uh, before we get that deep into a hole. Because once we get that deep into a hole, there, there's there's no coming out. I, I mean, there's going to have to be a massive restructuring. Uh, and I want to make sure everybody is rowing in the same direction and that these aren't just, it's just going to pass because the economy has opened up. Uh, but again, these are all, I understand, very preliminary numbers. Uh, and as time comes on, the state is going to get far more specific on uh, where the budget numbers are going to be. Um, but these numbers are not to be taken lightly by people. Uh, we need to start doing some serious thoughts um, on where our, our payroll is going and so forth. Uh, there is a very real possibility um, that staff is not going to get a raise, but actually going to end up having to take a cut in some manner. Uh, we have to remind people that 85% of our budget, approximately, is in human resources. Our most, most valuable asset that this district has is, is human resources. But when you're $18 million in the hole out of $50 million, there's only one spot that that money comes from, uh, and, unless we can figure out better ways to do things. Uh, so I just want people to know uh, we are going to be working really hard to minimize those impacts. Uh, but there will be an impact somewhere along the line. I agree. And this is the preliminary budget. Uh, historically, it gets worse from here. It More does. gets taken away. So, I mean, Mr. Wong is painting the true picture here in that we are facing some major budgetary uh, restrictions and, and cuts. I mean, we're just gonna have to, to do it in order to be solvent and prudent. And we do have a history of being financially prudent and we are probably in a better position than most, but it, it, that doesn't relieve us from our responsibility. True comments. Anybody else? Uh, thank you, Ms. Wu. Uh um, I just oh, wanted, I'm so, I'm so, I'm so sorry. Um, I just, you know, as Brian is, has really brought it forward, how, how dire this um, situation can be in terms of, is going to be in terms of our budget. ADA is important. Attendance is important. Making sure that we um, retain our students and get more students is important. And um, I'm hoping that we can, um, make the public aware of the online courses that we have within our district um, as well through, I think it's through Mountain Park, correct? Kath, uh, Catherine? Ind independent study. Independent yes. study through Mountain Park. Um, that, I think, yes. I think it's important that we, we do let the public know that we do have independent study within our district because um, that that is an option and that might be an option that some people want to go with. Um, and and we, I think that we need to provide information about all of the options and all of the opportunities that we have to have um, their student be here in MUSD so that we can, um, we, we can have these students here. Uh, it, 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 lots of different possibilities. 
Anyone else? Uh, thank everybody. The comments are very, very important and you're absolutely right, Brian and Celine and Maritza. The, the outlook here is stormy weather in front and um, unfortunately no one passed out umbrellas. So we're gonna be figuring this thing out why it comes over us. Um, up next, we have the um, consent calendar. I'll entertain a motion for consent. So moved. Well, second. second. Motion and second. Is there any discussion? Ms. Huff, let me please have a vote. Board Member Lockerbie? Yes. Board Member Travanti? Yes. Board Member Gilliland? Yes. Board Member Wong? Yes. For President Hammond? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Up first, we have Ed Services, Dr. Kaiser, with uh, a memorandum of understanding with Coder School. <clears throat> Good evening, President Hammond, members of the board. The Board of Education is requested to approve a memorandum of understanding with the Coder School Pasadena to provide student internship opportunities for our Monrovia Un Un Unified High School students as part of our work-based learning program in the spirit of partnerships and co cooperation to promote improving career technical education for the benefit of students enrolled in the district's career academies and to benefit the community at large. We are looking to this MOU um, for approval. The students who are going to be participating as interns with the Coder School will be provided with work-based learning as an internship. There is no cost to the district and this gives our students that hands-on work-based real-time experience so that they are better prepared for career when they, they finish with these academies. Any questions of Sue? Thank you very much. Uh, may I entertain a motion? So moved. Second. second. There's a motion second. and a second. Any discussion? Ms. Huff, may we please have a vote? Board member, board member Travanti. Yes. Board member Gilliland? Yes. Board member Wong? Yes. Board member Lockerbie? Unmuted. Yes. Board <laughs> President Hammond? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you, Ms. Wu. May we have a resolution to designate business services administrators? Yes, again, good evening, everybody. Um, as you recall, that uh, um, back to middle of the March, the President Trump and our governor declared a serious emergency. Because of that and that declaration, it allowed uh, us to apply FEMA as well as the state call OS agency for the financial assistance. And as a result of the cost uh, that just occurred due to the pandemics. So this uh, um, resolution will allow the, uh, the, the district employee or administrator to communicate with the FEMA in regarding the um, emergency related cost. So, so that the district will be get reimbursed for the cost from the both federal and state. This um, resolution, um, it's the window of the resolution to cover three years, and it not only cover the um, COVID-19 pandem uh, pandemic, also including any uh, emergency disaster. Any questions of Connie? But, Honey, I just have one. Oh, go ahead. No, please go ahead. No, oh, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to um, make this clear. So this is um, this is a resolution that you are asking for, so that every time every time you want to go and advocate for money from FEMA or OES, you don't have to come to the board. That this is a resolution that is um, asking for the for the board's permission to let you apply for FEMA, apply for money uh, as as you need and as you see fit and as you can. Is that correct? 
That's correct. And I just want to make sure this is actually we uh, the resolution covers three positions of the district administrator. One is uh, my position, the assistant superintendent business service. The second staff, uh, second manager is the director of fiscal service. The, the third one is director of MOT. This uh, um, authorized three of us on behalf of the district to deal with uh, FEMA in regarding of the cost of reimbursement from the uh, from the federal and the states. So that's you. Fernando Martinez, and who's the third David person? Conway. David Conway. And David. So that, mm -hmm. would, so, so that would be that we would allow the three of you to um, deal with FEMA, F FEMA issues without having to come to us each time. That's correct. It would be the three of you independently or the three of you together so that you work together to do this unified or it, are they separate? Uh, compartments so we are uh, work together uh, the three individual desks just in case uh, and uh, i'm not available and then my uh, director can be stepping in in, in in my shoes to deal with uh, the state agency has fema had any type of um indication of how much money uh they're going to release specifically to schools specifically for this particular uh, subject. The the rule of thumb is uh, FEMA normally uh, reimburse the district up to seventy five percent of the cost. Okay, that's not going to happen. I, I mean, that's just not going to happen. Um, so they have not given the dollar amount as to what what the congressional uh, what they're asking for 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 excess funds. That's correct. And uh, once I receive more detailed information, I will uh, submit for the board. And we haven't actually determined what our uh, total dollar amount is going to be. No, because uh, um, we the cost uh, will be ongoing. Uh, as uh, Mr. Wang just present, you know, we still we are in the process to prepare the school reopening. So there's a lot of supplies still need, such as the plastic glasses, such as the petition, potentially you know, needed by the preschool. So um, at this uh, um, moment, it's difficult to uh, anticipate, but we, we will uh, try to lay out what is the school building looks like. We'll have a much better idea after that framework come out so that we can anticipate what is the um, cost. I, I can only assume that these, these numbers are gonna change as we determine how we're gonna open up our schools and what that's going to look like. So can, can you uh, or your department give to the board on a weekly basis a running total of what you think would be a qualifying uh, expenses for, for these various government programs? Uh, and if you have projections for things that you think that we're going to need or that we're putting out for bid to, to acquire, can you include those as well so we can kind of keep our finger on the pulse to, to know how much money is being spent or what the expectations of our expenses are going to be? Sure, uh, we'll do that. Perfect. Could, I, could I tack on to what Mr. Wong said? So you're asking for kind of a running total for our expenses but we have, uh, we have some money that might be coming in, emergency money that might be coming in. SB 170 and CARE. Does that make sense? Oh, that's someone barking. Um, um, is, is that correct? We have the, the CARES funding has that already passed? We've already gotten that money. Um, so um, I think it sounds like a little bit confusing. And uh, um, this is a different uh, um, funding sources to help the district. Uh, that's right. Uh, we received the SB17 um, COVID-19 relief money. is a, a little bit over $89,000. And then the FEMA, because of the state and the national in declaration for the emergency, and the all the costs related to the um, pandemic is also entitled to the um, FEMA reimbursement. So we try to um, get uh, all our costs reimbursed as much as possible because the need is huge. 
So it's a different, two different resources. I, I totally understand that it's two different. I just like to, you know, I, I'd like to see our, our expense and, and our, our relief income. So, you know, if, if we're getting money from SB 117 and CARES and OES and FEMA, I'd like to see how we're e sure, sure. equal evening out. Yeah, sure. We, we will provide uh, all the information related to uh, um, the um, COVID-19 pandemic. It's the it's revenue and the funding sources and the, our cost. Connie, has FEMA set the final rules for what uh, we can submit for costs for that? So the FEMA, um, they have provided a lot of guideline information, including the training. So um, the first step is they ask us to register. That's what we did. We register um, um, our information. We get the login number. And the, uh, the second process is they want to have this uh, uh, resolution. So, so this is the kind of process. So once we have the resolution and uh, we will submit the reimbursement for the expenditure already occurred. Okay, but they're not going to let us just, uh, you know, any old expense we want to throw in there isn't going to be reimbursable. Have they set the guidelines for what expense type of expenses we can submit? Um, yes, they have, they have okay. guidelines. Sometimes FEMA keeps that a moving target for months and years, so I'm glad they haven't here. Yeah. Thank you. That doesn't mean it won't change. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I have a funny feeling there's moving targets everywhere here. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. Thank you. Up next, we have Dr. Jackson as a memorandum of understanding. Oh, between we need a vote. Oh, I guess we need to vote. Can I have yeah. a uh, motion, please? So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Uh, any more discussion? Maybe please have a vote, Ms. Hogg. Board Member Gilliland? Yes. Board Member Wong? Yes. Board Member Lockerbie? Yes. Board Member Travanti? Yes. Board President Hammond? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. All right, Darvin, you had plenty of time to warm up. You ready to go? Uh, I am. Okay. Board President Hammond, members of the board. The Board of Education is requested to approve a memorandum of understanding between the Monrovia Unified School District and Azusa Pacific University commencing on July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2025. This MOU is a renewal of our existing partnership with Azusa Pacific University for their student teacher program. There is no additional cost to the district. Any questions, Darvin? Uh, maybe please have a motion. So moved. Second. Motion is second. Any more discussion? Maybe please have a vote. Board Member Wong? Yes. Board Member Lockerbie? Yes. Board Member Travanti? Yes. Board Member Gilliland? Yes. Board President Hammond? Yes. Motion carries five zero. And still in the batter's box, Mr. Jackson, Dr. Jackson. Or President Hammond, members of the board, Dr. Tarosian, community members, cabinet. Uh, this collective bargaining agreement uh, settles negotiations for the 2018 2019, as well as the 2019 2020 school year. Uh, interesting time uh, for this being presented as this agreement was entered into. Uh, prior to uh, the onset of the pandemic. Therefore, the Board of Education is requested to approve a 0.61% increase to salary and longevity schedules for uh, the Monrovia Teachers Association, California School Employees Association, Monrovia Association of School Administrators, and Confidential Classified Management, retroactive only to July 1st, 2019 of this year, as supported by the second interim AB uh, 1200 report. It also should be noted that the district and the bargaining associations acknowledge that the co coronavirus pandemic may uh, affect the budget projections for the 2021 school year as uh, Ms. Wu uh, presented a little earlier. 
given the long history of working with the district during difficult budget times, the associations have reaffirmed and have already started conversations around their commitment to work together with the district to resolve these challenges. Any questions of Darwin? Uh, just a quick comment. I just want to remind everybody, this is for past school years. This is from 2018 to 2020. This is for time served already. Uh, we've had a fantastic relationship with the various uh, stakeholders uh, and everybody has negotiated in good faith, I think. Uh, and it's just by bad coincidence that this is coming up on a day in which we're finding our future budgets are gonna be in a, a massive hole. Uh, I have all the confidence in the world in Darwin and the, all the members on the team to take the same honest look at where what's in front of us and to find the best path forward. Good comment, very good comment. Anyone else wishing to comment? I just Interview. wanted to comment. Oh. Um, I, I'm glad Mr. Wong said something and it, uh, I've decided to say something also that I, I don't want it to look like we're just glossing over something as important as um, a salary negotiation. We have all this entire board, um, we have all been updated and apprised and informed about what has been going on for the past, um, for as long as it has been going on. So um, I wanna thank um, Dr. Jackson specifically for sitting with me and, and explaining the process. It's, it's a very involved process. Um, and um, I, it, he spent a long time explaining it to me so that I would understand it. And I know that he has spent a lot of time with um, um, the people involved um, with this negotiations, with these negotiations, explaining everything for everybody. So um, I'm, I'm grateful for you. Um, explaining those things to me and to all of us and i want to let the um the public know that we have all been um well informed on this and and we have been following this for a while so thank you thank you thank you <clears throat> entertain a motion so moved second motion and a second discussion miss huffman will we please have a vote Board member lockerbie yes Board member Travanti? Yes. Board member Wong? Yes. Board member Gilliland? Yes. Board president Hammond? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. And last at bat, Dr. Jackson. Board president Hammond, members of the board, Dr. Tarosi and cabinet and community. The Board of Education is requested to receive and approve two memorandums of understandings between the Monrovia Unified School District and the Monrovia Teachers Association, as well as the California School Employees Association and its Chapter 20. These MOUs have been reviewed extensively by Cabinet and both associations. In addition, they have been reviewed by our legal counsel, uh, Dr. Maggie Chidester, to ensure compliance with all legal guidelines, as well as alignment with all current distance learning expectations established mm -hmm. by Cabinet. These MOUs will expire on June 30th, 2020. At that time, we will revisit them to determine next steps considering the structure of the 2021 school year. Questions? Uh, entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Ms. Huffman, will you please have a vote? Board Member Travanti? Yes. Board Member Wong? Yes. Board Member Gilliland? Yes. Board Member Lockerbie? Yes. Board President Hammond? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Uh, up next was uh, Charles Babakin, who will give us the report on the contract for E-rate related services. Uh, good evening, President uh, Hammond, board members, district staff, members of the community. The Board of Education is requested to approve an agreement. Uh, this is a renewal with CSMG for e-rate consultant services. 
so that the district can apply for eBay eligible products and services. Uh, this is for the approval not to exceed 23K uh, services that they've provided in the past. Uh, for example, uh, of recent, a few months ago, uh, we uh, applied for network equipment uh, up to 175K of which the district would pay no more than 35K. And very recently we got E-rate approval for our new ISP, our mm -hmm. internet service provider. Um, internet access uh, and our circuits are 165K of which the district's portion is 41K. So I, I think we're getting a, a good value for a dollar and making sure that we're getting E-rate funding and making sure that uh, we're dotting our I's and crossing our T's to make sure that uh, our funding is not lost. Uh, just, just as a quick reminder, this is one of those use it or lose it type of things. And I don't want uh, people to think uh, as we're talking about all these uh, negative uh, issues ahead of us that we're spending these large numbers that you're saying out of our own pocket and that e-fund uh, is going to cover the vast majority of this. Uh, and if we don't use these funds, uh, we just don't get it. Noted. Any other questions for Charles? Entertain a motion. So move. So move. Oh. Second. Motion and a second. Is there any more discussion? May we please have a vote? Board Member Wong? Yes. Board Member Gilliland? Yes. Board Member Lockerbie? Yes. Board Member Travanti? Yes. Or President Hammond? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Uh, Charles, still up. Chromebooks. Yes. Um, the Board of Education is requested to approve the purchase of Chromebooks. This district has a little over 4,000 Chromebooks in our fleet, and this purchase would allow us to continue to support digital programs and move towards digital literacy for all students. The funding for this purchase will be paid out of from multiple funding sources, Title II. Title IV, Career Technical Education Incentive Grant, as well as Supplemental and Concentration Funds. This is for an approval not to exceed $635,000. Uh, we are looking to pare it down a little bit as we are verifying some numbers. And uh, right now it's just for an approval uh, not to exceed. I, I have a couple of comments. First of all, the question is, will we, will we be replacing some of our aged computers that our teachers currently have with some of the equipment that we're looking to purchase here? Uh, yes, so some of these Chromebooks uh, will also be used for, uh, for teaching Chromebooks. Um, some of the teachers do have PCs that date back as old as 2008. So these Chromebooks can potentially replace those, those aging PCs that are, that are out there. Um, a lot of them are from around 2008. Okay. And as we move and we're looking that we're going to be in a virtual platform for whatever the near future looks like, we know for sure for summer school and possibly more than likely going into the, uh, the fall, uh, will this be able to put the devices in updated devices in the hands of our students? Yes, we're going to get very close. We, we currently have over 4,000. We're looking to get about 1,500 or so uh, um, total Chromebooks. This will put us, us as about 5,500 Chromebooks. So we will have one in almost every student hands, if not all of them. We do have um, some Chromebooks that we know will be expiring next year, and we'll have to worry about those set of Chromebooks uh, next year. And those expiration, how many, um, I, I apologize, I don't want to give the wrong impression. Um, approximately how many Chromebooks are expiring in 2021? Right, I'm going to have to look that up, but I believe it's around 1,600 Chromebooks um, expiring in 2021. And, and these were Chromebooks that were purchased, I believe, in 2014, 2015. Uh, they typically have around a six-year life cycle. Uh, there was a set of Chromebooks that um, Google decided to extend their expiration um, for another year. And that, I think, was around 700 Chromebooks that would have expired this summer, but they're going to be extended for one more year and they will be expiring next summer. 
So they kind of now collided where we're going to have a, a, a set of about 1600, I believe, Chromebooks expiring next year. Can, can you explain to, to the parents at home, because most people who buy a PC or a laptop or what have you, buy it and keep it and that's it. Um, but we also have a situation in which we buy the hardware, but we're responsible for um, upgrading the software. Uh, and I think in some of these Chromebooks that you're talking about, we're not physically getting new Chromebooks as much as we are getting them registered again. Is that correct? Or are they all brand new Chromebooks? Uh, the, for this approval, not to exceed 635K, we are, are, are quoting brand new Chromebooks. And brand new Chromebooks will typically have a life cycle of about uh, six years. Uh, we did look at refurbished Chromebooks that are two years old, which mean that they would have four years left on them. But when you annualize the cost, the cost of refurbished divided by four years versus brand new divided by six year is actually lower cost to get a brand new Chromebooks um, annualized um, over six years. So, so we don't have any Chromebooks in which the license is running out? Um, when you buy a Chromebook, you have to buy licenses and the licenses go for the life of the Chromebook. The life of the Chromebook is typically six years um, in the instance of uh, uh, about 700 or so of them, um, they, they're going seven years because Google extended the, the life of it. Uh, Charles, just for clarification, when you say a Chromebook is expiring, which we have approximately 1,600, 1,700 expiring, does that mean we take that Chromebook and we're done? It goes to e-waste and we're done? Or is it still in the lube? Is it still usable and because if we're purchasing 1500 and we're losing 16, 1700 net, we're, we're lower. So I just want to have a better understanding of what you mean by expiring. Okay. So what Google does is they call it um, auto um, update expiration. And what it really means is that um, they don't guarantee that the Chromebooks will update to the latest operating system anymore. The Chromebooks are still usable. Um, as long as the apps uh, support that version. So what will happen over time is there will be new versions of apps coming out and they will say that you need to run the latest version. So over time, these Chromebooks will no longer work. Now they could potentially be repurposed for things such as maybe library circulation, for example, where they might not require the newest version of a software. Uh, they could potentially be used more at the preschool settings. So there is some usage for those that are quote unquote expire, but for certain apps, and I'll give an example, one is called iReady. iReady always um, support three versions back. So once the, that Chromebook um, is no longer able to update, when three new versions of the Chrome software comes out, that Chromebook will no longer be able to run iReady, for example. So you definitely can't use an expired Chromebook in situations where you need to use iReady but in other scenarios you could, and those are scenarios we'll have to look at and properly place those Chromebooks so that they can still be somewhat useful. All right, thanks. I have a better understanding of that. And then from uh, assuming we approve this tonight, from, from tonight to when we have them in our hands and you're able to you know, add the filters, whatever you need to do to set up the Chromebooks, when, would, when do you expect them to be ready, the, the 1500? We are going to try, keyword try, to get them ready for the beginning of the school year. Uh, right now, as it is, it's a 60, I believe it's around a 60 day uh, lead time. So when we order it, we're not gonna get it for 60 days. And we're gonna basically be gearing up um, our work order system. I'm gonna prioritize you know, taking care of work orders, certain things and, and organizing it in such a way so that we can hopefully be prepared for um, getting in these Chromebooks and, and setting them up as, as quickly as possible. And one of the great things that has happened recently uh, with uh, Mr. Alan Chow coming on board, he brought with him expertise um, on using certain devices. He, um, we purchased some devices that actually now help us automate the deployment uh, of Chromebooks. So we, we plug in a USB stick, type in a couple of keystrokes, and the USB stick sets it up for us. So now we have even a more efficient way of setting up Chromebooks as well. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Charles. Any other Charles, questions for Charles? I have a question. If we're spending 
all of this money um, to buy um, a large quantity of uh, Chromebooks, are we getting a discount? Uh, yes, we are. So I've, I've been working with them on uh, quantity discounting. And uh, what I've also are, am doing is we are quoting this under piggyback, uh, piggyback bids. So we have looked at various bids because other districts have already bid it out. We looked at the Irvine piggyback bid, the Laco piggyback bid. And uh, right now the lowest cost is through uh, WISCA, um, Western States California Alliance. That's kind of a state organization that does uh, statewide bid, statewide bids. So we're going to be purchasing purchasing this off the Wiska piggyback uh, contract. Awesome, thank you very much for that. And, and Charles, um, I think Ed got locked out, and you have to let him back in. Okay. It's unlocked and he can come in when he, he tries to get in. Okay. Um, there's any other questions of Charles? May I entertain a motion? So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Ms. Huffman, you please have a vote. Board Member Lockerbie? Yes. Board Member Travanti? Yes. Board member Gilliland, is he here? I'm here, but I missed the discussion, so I'll abstain. Board member Wong? Yes. Board president Hammond? Yes. Motion carries 4 1. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Charles. Up next is uh, Dr. Tarosian on uh, board business. Thank you, President Hammond, members of the board. We're presenting today for a first reading uh, board policy regarding distance learning. This is the recommended uh, policy by the California School Board Association, and it covers some of the, the variables, provides some guidelines and overview about this uh, distance learning. This is a brand new policy, one that we have not had in our uh, bylaws before, or excuse me, in our board policies before. It has been reviewed by uh, the Monrovia Teachers Association uh, representatives, and it is here uh, just for your discussion and input. Ed, this is what you've been looking at and working on. Uh, this is a little bit different. Uh... I'm okay with this policy uh, right now, but I would like to put it on our uh, board uh, items to, to uh, review and review, review it in a year when we have more experience under our belt. So I think this is fine for right now where we're at, but, uh, but a year from now, it might, we might have some other things that we wanna include in this policy. So if we could review it, then that'd be great. We'll add it Sounds to our pending like board issue, Jen. Good call, Ed. Yeah. So this is our this is the first read of this. Yes. Okay, so we're not adopting this right now, is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. It will come back at our next meeting either as a consent or a, a discussion item. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments? Okay, Kathy. I would I say, you... Rob, unless unless somebody comes up with a question between now and the next meeting, I would suggest it come back on the consent agenda. Of course, if anybody has any questions or discussion, we can always put it on the regular right, agenda. Right, you can always move it. That that that's fine. Um. Up next, Kathy, is a resolution for federal education funding. Yes, and I'm going to invite Ms. Wu to help us through the, the resolution. This is to advocate for uh, funding in light of impacts associated with COVID-19. Ms. Wu. Difficult.
This was the worrisome Anybody time. See me? No, I can hear you. Here, uh, let me block my screen. Go ahead. Okay. Board, um, as the um, board member mentioned that uh, the district tried to advocate that uh, the, the, the district do need the funding. So that's, that's why we want the board support our advocates so that during this budget cut, we need to uh, stay to real, realize our challenge to support, support us. Uh -oh. okay. I, think. I think that Connie's left the, the building is um, Dr. Perosian. Yes, so the resolution advocates for uh, for stable pub funding of public schools from um, our legislatures and from our um, elected representatives. Okay, so this you know, this thing was so fragmented, Kathy, could you just go ahead and just give that report one more time? Of course. I, the, the resolution reflects upon the, the, uh, the challenges that public schools are uh, enduring right now and the additional uh, budgetary strains. It references the um, UCLA Anderson School of um, Economics uh, forecast for uh, the nation, which uh, reflects a very uh, tenuous economy and uh, suggests that the packages, whether it's the CARES Act or anything else, isn't going to be enough to stabilize uh, public schools and therefore this resolution and this board would be advocating for the senators and the House of Representatives and the governor of California to advocate for additional federal funding to prioritize stable public school funding. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions of Dr. Tarosi? I have a question. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. So this is us advocating or encouraging our legislatures to send more money for public education is that what this is that that is accurate yes hopefully it encourages them to submit a bill requesting for funding for public education and that it trickles down to i, I think that's the point that we need to do yeah. is ask for specific language in one of the um packages that they put together instead right. of hoping actually yeah. direct correct kathy doesn't this uh letter also not just ask for money but ask for some flexibilities that are are kind of uh fiscal neutral to them but gives us the ability to manage our money a little bit better that's a separate letter that we've already sent to uh california legislators this would be for federal advocating for federal funding. Oh, okay. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? I have a question. Can we make this resolution or another resolution that comes from more than just the board? Can we make a resolution that includes our constituents or that's us. When we do it, we're doing it on behalf of our of this community. Okay, but I don't want to use the word petition because I, I don't want to use the word petition. But if a resolution has five signatures on it, representing so many people, or one signature on it, the president's representing five people, representing 40,000 people, it's different than a letter with 40,000 signatures on it. Is and I there... disagree. There's a represent House of Representatives with 435 people on it that when it's signed, that is the entirety of the United States. And that's what that's what we're doing. Our community, and I don't I don't 
I'm sorry about giving it not a civics lesson, but that's the purpose of us doing this is that we are the duly elected representatives of this community and we're saying this is important to this community. It's as if there were 40,000 signatures when we signed. All true, but we got we got a we got a reaction from um Catherine Barger's office when more than just us called. Well, I think there might be an opportunity here, Celine and, and Rob. It, is I'm I'm with Rob on the fact that this resolution is the board's the board's resolution, but I do think we can put a cover on letter on it that could be signed by uh, PTA, by the uh, by the unions, by the city, whoever uh, wants to help uh, get this message to our legislators. But as far as the resolution itself, I do think the resolution has to come from the board. But we can always send it with a cover letter that includes many stakeholders if we wanted to. The, and, and the only reason I'm jumping in on the whole thing is because time is of the essence. I agree. And getting all these people together to do this is, and particularly right this minute, is yep. very hard to do. Sure. And, and this was this was me legitimately asking a question and, and, and I appreciate the input um, and, it, and just also, you know, sound sounding some 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 ideas off of the yeah. board. Celine, so. I totally hear what you're saying. And um, and definitely the public has a right to advocate as well on their own individually. Um, uh, us adopting this is representing them, but it there it does not preclude any individual from contacting their representatives, uh, emailing, tweeting, however you know whatever platform they decide to use. Um, but yeah, I think I agree. Time is of the essence. We need to get this off. Um, but yeah, I agree. This isn't me saying that I, I, I'm, I'm not for getting this off immediately because yes, you are right, it does, but it just, it brings to mind. What well, we can do, I think what we can do is the, the board can pass the resolution because that's clearly in our purview. Uh, what we've done in the past uh, when we've had other budgetary problems with the state is we can put together uh, language and send it out to various parents and student groups and what have you if they want to uh, let their representatives know. Uh, a lot of people just struggle because they don't know what to say and they don't know how to say it. They don't know how long it should be or how short it should be or what. But if we put together a form letter, talking points, bullet points for people to say, if this is important to you, here are a list of people you might want to send an email to. Here are their emails. Here are their phone numbers. Here are some talking points that you should put in your own words uh, that are important to you. Uh, and as we saw with our graduation, if the topic is important enough to the parents, they will rise up and they will have their voices heard. Uh, and I think th there is nothing more important to a parent with kids in the schools at this point in time, when they see how bad this is, to stand up and say, you need to educate my kids. You need to provide enough uh, funds so we have teachers there. But, but I do think that that is something that the parents need to do on their own, but we can help them by putting something out there uh, so they can have something to reference. The difference between this and what happened with graduation, graduation was a call to action. And right now, we don't have a call to action. And the reason being is because whatever we're doing hasn't been denied. And th it would be a little bit like putting the cart before the horse. If there was a, a, a swarm of people to come and address an issue before it's even become an issue, I, I think it'd be a little bit like um, you know, punching at shadows. It, it would almost, you respond to, you respond to something with a call to action. And right now, this is the first step in saying, this is important to us. And as the elected representatives of this community, we're saying that this is important to the community. 
it's when the ball starts to roll is when you start putting the call to action together. Right the now, ball the ball has already started to roll with the May, with the governor's May revision. In, yeah, but this is um, this is on the fed our budget's going to be. Right, we're talking. This is federal, though. This is not the state. But that letter that Brian was talking to could easily include all um, California legislators as well as the, uh, at the federal level. And that way we're addressing the funding issue all the way around. Right. What, what's happening right now is California is looking towards Washington, D.C. to help backfill its side because California can't print money and Washington, D.C. can. And so the issue is right now all eyes go to Washington to get the money. And as we know, it's going to get caught in a quagmire of politics if um, there is going to be another round of funding. And that's where you want to be if it does, does come up. That's why you want to get this letter in so that if it does come up, that we're already in line. When it comes time for them to get ready to go is when you want to start the advocacy in earnest saying, notice me. I've been there in line. I've had, I have my paperwork ready to go. And we want to be recognized as having a, um, a, a dog in this fight. That's when you would hit the button for everybody to please contact your legislator to get the funding. Right now, it's the beginning of the process. Absolutely, um, at the federal level. But I think that uh, if this letter has state and federal legislators i mean let's just let's just say you know what it is before this pandemic before we knew anything we were not being properly funded in california they need to hear us we uh, public education for years <laughs> right so um it certainly wouldn't hurt to have that information a template so that our constituents can advocate for public education um, individually. Well, th this resolution is a good basis for uh, going forward with the request for feds to do something for us. But also, I do think we need to start developing the strategy for how we let this community know how dire this situation is and how important that is, is for them to get involved. Uh, we, can't, we can't lobby but they can and we can all always put out fact sheets uh, to our constituents to let them know uh, how hard this is going to hit the schools but we need we need some meat to that you know right now it's just we know it's going to hit us hard but we don't have you know how many teachers is that how many classrooms is that what what are we going to have to cut and uh and i don't know did, did you say that we cannot lobby we can't lobby <laughs> Can you explain that? Can we not lobby? There are certain things we can lobby for. There are certain things we can't lobby for. Uh, we need to review that rule. Okay. Uh, my understanding that on the is we have because it has to do with finances. When we're when we were looking at the school bond, we had to be very careful how we worded our our letters because we couldn't lobby. So I, well, it, there it's, are certain things there are asking, specific rules we need to look at. You, you cannot lobby the federal government using federal federal money to lobby them. That right. you cannot. But we have every right to go and lobby anytime we want. In fact, that's our we job. as individuals do. We as individuals do. So as a board, we can't lobby for certain things. What I'm telling you is we need to look at the rules because there were, remember Brian, when we were doing our public information for the bond, there were rules on how we could, you know, what we could say and what we couldn't. <laughs> right, what, what Ed's referring to is uh, as a board, you cannot lobby for a ballot, uh, for an item that is on the ballot. So if we're, if we're asking for uh, trying to write, raise a school bond, uh, I, th I think that we were, our council prohibited us from lobbying from, from the dais to say that you as parents need to do this. That, that's, that's where I, I think that the no lobbying comes in. My, my issue for the, and I understand, you know, um, 
most of our funding, if not all of our funding is coming from the state. Well, obviously a good portion of it is. The, the part and the reason why I think it's really important to get ahead on the federal side um, is, and it goes back to an earlier conversation about FEMA uh, and how they're supposed to reimburse 75% of these expenses. Well, there, there's no chance that they're going to be able to do it at this point in time with the funding they have. Anybody who was around for Katrina or had to go through that process will quickly understand how inept uh, as a group that organization is. Uh, and that was in one very small area. This is a nationwide issue in which every school board mm -hmm. shut down is going to be impacted by this. My concern is when Congress comes together, they're gonna to have to pass additional funding, emergency funding for FEMA to cover all of the different uh, needs that are out there, legitimate needs that are out there. Schools are one very small piece of the people who are gonna have uh, their hand out to FEMA saying, you need to help me. Uh, I really just, I'm trying to make sure that when Congress comes together, they carve out a portion specifically for schools. I don't want all the FEMA money to go to, let's say to the state, and then the state is the one who's supposed to divide it up among its multiple entities. So, so, so my, my purpose for saying, I want people to uh, write their congressmen uh, is, to, is specifically for federal funds to make sure that they are marked directly for schools and for no other purpose than schools. That that was my thought process. I don't disagree. And and the the notion of not being able to lobby from the dais for a school bond is absolutely correct. But we are not restricted in lobbying the federal government unless we're using federal money to lobby the federal government. So if we're not then we, we have every right to go lobby for that. Um, I, I've done this for years, and the only restriction that I'm aware of is the one that says you cannot use federal money to lobby the federal government, which would mean if we took the money that the federal government gives the school district to perform, to perform its teaching function, and we somehow bought plane tickets and uh, a hotel room to go to Washington, D.C. with that funding, that would be an illegal use of those funds. Um, but if we're not using those funds and we're, and we're just using general fund money to lobby the federal government, that's perfectly acceptable. And that is my understanding of what I've done for years. Well, and re remember- And we're, and we're not gonna use Title I money, so. Is no. Lobbyist? Uh, remember, we did go to D.C. specifically for the purpose of trying to Im improve our special ed situation. Special ed. Right. So, and, and we did do that as as a group, and I thought that was very useful uh, for for all parties involved to have those one on one conversations. So, I'm not saying we we shouldn't be able to do that again, um, but I, I, well, I just. No, I, but I think the call for action on this thing is a very, very good idea. I just think this is the first step. And if the next step is necessary, then of course we go out into the public and say, look at, we need your help. Um, and Brian, your point of having a form letter um, is absolutely correct because most people don't know what to say. So how do you address a Senator, you know, how, it'd be easy to just put the letter together and somebody send it on their own email and you send them in that way. And Celine, your comment about that is absolutely spot on too. You get results when you do bring the weight of the community to bear. But I don't think we're there yet. I mean, well, that, that, would the, right, that would be right. a step not I, there I don't, yet. I don't disagree with us needing to move forward on this resolution that we have before us. And I do understand that I've, I've maybe veered a little off of this or beyond this but to use your analogy um mr hammond when you said um uh, to have a have a dog in the fight I, I, would, wouldn't you want the biggest dog you know um and so, so, so no i want the most effective dog is the one i want <laughs> 
Well, and, and, and I'm not saying that I think that we are ineffective. I think that we are absolutely effective, but I think that um, also having, ha having more of the community behind us or more of the community lobbying uh, for this is, is also effective and it's, it's effective in a different way. So I, I do realize that I've gone a little, a little off of this particular resolution, but I really do believe that if if everyone's going to be in line with their handout, let's be a big voice. Let's be united. Let's be already in line with our posse. That's that's what I think, and it doesn't mean that I I don't agree with this resolution, um, but I think that we we could do more. I, I think everybody is saying the same thing. Maybe it's a little bit of timing. Yep. You know, obviously the first step is let's let's sign this resolution. Let's get this thing sent off. In the meantime, uh, Kathy and staff can get some kind of a uh, talking points for a community, and we can sit, put together a game plan for when the time is appropriate, uh, as Rob said, to to reach out and have them address something very specific uh, that will be ready to go. So we don't have to uh, wait to the last second and then think, what are we going to do? We can be ready to roll as soon as the time is appropriate to pull the trigger and have everybody go at once. My two cents. It's a good two cents. Um, <laughs> Three any cents. More uh, Ms. Up, can we have a, uh, me, I need a motion, please. So move. Second. Motion second. and a second. Any more discussion? Maybe please have a vote. Board Member Gilliland? Yes. Board Member Lockerbie? Yes. Board Member Travanti? Yes. Board Member Wong? Yes. Board President Hammond? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Up next, we have a board discussion regarding um, 2021. It's got to be Dr. Tarosian. It is, and I'm going to share my screen, and hopefully this will work so that we can go through the presentation. Do I see anything there? Yes, we can. Yeah. I can. Yeah. Does this look like a PowerPoint? Yes. yes it does. Does. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, last month, you'd asked for uh, a discussion about what the 2021 school year will look like. And I thought it would be helpful to have a uh, kind of a framework from which to, to discuss. Uh, today's presentation will provide an overview of events leading us to today and, and then discussing a little further about what the planning process will be like for the 2021 school year. And then what the five stages of reopening uh, will reflect, especially in terms of the Department of Public Health. There are several instructional models that we'll be discussing, as well as the priorities uh, and uh, discrete areas that must be addressed before we uh, open schools. Health and safety, instruction and campus life, social emotional support systems, family and community engagement, and uh, operations and operational alternatives. Uh, the information here has been culled from several sources the Department of Public Health, the Los Angeles County Office of Education, and the Center for Disease Control Prevention. So simply in terms of a timeline, as a, I'm not sure we need a reminder, but we know that schools closed, ooh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Ooh? What? Okay. Uh, schools closed on um, March 13th, 
and uh, we actually reopened schools soon thereafter. Uh, on March 16th, we had a staff development day and issued Chromebooks. On March 17th, distance learning uh, began in earnest in Monrovia Unified. So since that time, in the last couple of months, we've distributed about 1,500 Chromebooks, almost 150,000 meals. We've created communication systems, uh, worked through newsletters, provided office hours to parents and students, and pr provided uh, tech support. Uh, we've worked through communication and response uh, on a regular basis. Our primary function in looking ahead will be to develop a task force, an elementary and a secondary task force, uh, because the world at the elementary school level is very different than that in the secondary, simply in terms of logistics and uh, classrooms uh, that static and um, dynamic classes and changes. So to develop a task force whose objective is to develop a framework for opening schools based on current assumptions and conditions, but also to be agile enough to change as the conditions change. Uh, the task force will be comprised of key district site and department person now, and uh, their responsibility would be not only to uh, discuss what we know, but also stay current with local and national policies and guidance. This is what has guided us up to this point and will need to continue to guide us as we move forward. Uh, in the process, we'll need to engage with our professional associations and of course our community partners. And the process would be an accordion process to inform and seek input from our constituents, from our stakeholders, from um, our staff, our parents, our students. And uh, continue to use an adaptive problem solving model as we in this continuously changing world. Uh, in Monrovia Unified, we have a great deal of experts and expertise uh, about education. We'll be relying on the strength of that, as well as the strength of uh, the entire organization to adapt and modify in order to meet the needs of our students. The Department of Public Health put out um, the five stages of reopening and reopening schools will not be as simple as the way we, we closed them and closed them immediately dismissing all students. We are not going to simply reopen all of them coming back together. It will be a process that reflects the process of reopening in you know, Los Angeles. I understand Los Angeles is in stage two now. Stage three will be coming up where uh, K-12 schools will open. I also want to mark that um, stage four is where larger groups uh, come together and sports uh, begin. And stage five would be going back to what we all uh, miss, and that is one another and the socialization uh, in our lives and, of course, in our schools. There are several instructional models. That which uh, we do best is the face-to-face -face where teachers and students meet physically in the same place at the same time for one-on-one or um, group classroom lessons. This is, um, that would be the, the one manner of doing it, but of course, uh, because we are not in stage five to, to look at a modified version of that with social distancing measures in place and develop ways to reduce the number of students and individuals in the same location. Another alternative is a, a hybrid model where we have both the distance learning and uh, the face-to-face the -face, uh, learning occurring uh, with different students or the same students in a different model. And then of course, distance learning is where we are today. In a survey, and again, this, this reflects the accordion process of seeking input so that we 
use that in order to make our plans. Uh, we did send out a survey to parents, students, and teachers uh, last week and asked everybody to uh, provide us with a response about multiple things. Some of the things that they thought uh, had gone well, things that we could perhaps uh, provide additional support in and what kind of instructional model they saw. And just in preliminary uh, data from uh, parents, about a fifth, and, and uh, Dr. Kaiser will correct me if I'm incorrect, but about a fifth wanted, uh, were interested in a distance learning continuing, and about a third face-to-face, -face, and uh, the remaining about uh, interested in a hybrid model. So we'll develop a model through this task force or both these task forces that consider the survey results and uh, also prepare us for multiple scenarios. Of course, the first thing that needs to be addressed is the health and safety of our students and our staff members. Uh, this is not something any of us take lightly. And uh, board member Wong had asked uh, for a running total of what some of that pr uh, protective equipment, the, uh, what are some of the things that we'll be using to keep our uh, schools and our uh, students and staff safe. This is just uh, the beginning of a list of doing that. We have actually already uh, purchased infrared thermometers as well as face shields uh, and, and masks and gloves, but we'll need much more if we're to continue. Uh, we'll need to focus on hygienic practices, and that may mean increasing hand washing stations, considering water bottle filling stations, and providing hand sanitizer. And of course, our uh, team will need to figure out uh, a process through which everything is sanitized regularly throughout the day and between sessions of learning. We'll need to eliminate some of the shared spaces. Uh, you know, some of our classrooms have experimented with flexible seating. Those will be things that we cannot sanitize and those shared spaces or even shared art supplies. Kids will not be sharing crayons. Uh, <laughs> yeah, some of the things we're used to seeing in a classroom will need to change in order to make sure that safety is assured. Uh, and then, of course, ensuring that uh, safety standards are met, we'll need to ensure that um, there's social distancing in classrooms and in, on, on buses. We'll need to, uh, the guide guidance from the CDC suggests uh, keeping windows open so that there's uh, better ventilation. We can put physical guides, uh, make sure that desks are six feet apart from one another. Uh, they recommend one-way hallways whenever that's feasible. And they also uh, recommend eliminating communal dining. So grabbing a lunch or having lunch in classrooms was another one of the recommendations for the CDC. In terms of instruction, provide our, what we really do best is to provide high quality instruction uh, and we are strong in our pedagogy. So we'll be needing to rely upon that strength to develop and select curriculum and instructional delivery models that will be effective for our students and figure out how to use assessments and, in order to inform our instruction and in order to prepare our students for um, local as well as state measures. We'll be uh, needing to discuss how to support our special populations, our most vulnerable populations, and ensure that we have access and use of instructional technology. I mentioned that we had distributed about 1,500 Chromebooks and we want to make sure that there's a continuity of service. We also understand that about 100, 150 of our families signed up for, uh, for free internet, new service through Giggle or through Spectrum. And that 
time is coming to an end. I, we purchased about 50 hotspots uh, to provide for them, which is of course an additional cost for us as is the service that goes along with it. But uh, this is imperative for our students to continue to learn in this new environment, in this new platform. Uh, I'm also excited to say that uh, in one of those uh, surveys, we, we applied for hotspots from the uh, California Department of Education and uh, Google, they had partnered and we've been allocated 100 hotspots. Now that's exciting. Um, and we wanna make sure to provide it to the families without service or whose service is expiring. But that too comes with a cost because while the hotspots are free, and unfortunately they came after we purchased about 50 of them, uh, they do incur costs and come with contracts. Uh, and then of course, we wanna make sure that we're not only providing uh, remediation, but also enrichment opportunities for our students. A co-curricular program is also part of uh, a robust system on campus and in our schools. And uh, while we have always invited visitors and volunteers and schools are a hub of activity, the recommendation is that that is limited uh, for a time being, limiting visitors, limiting volunteers, limiting group sizes. Uh, back to school night will look very different. Uh, identify static student and staff groups. So at the elementary level, making sure that students are not necessarily moving out in large groups and changing classrooms. How to do that at the secondary level remains part of the challenge that we'll need to determine uh, because one of the other recommendations is to limit the mixing between groups. And of course, at the secondary level, students of all levels uh, change classes and uh, mix, there's mixing. Uh, the recommendation is that the desk space all in the same direction uh, in the these smaller class size classrooms, the classrooms filled with fewer students in order to uh, adjust to the social distancing. And then this will of course impact how we can offer our athletics. We have great athletics arts uh, programs as well as uh, a vibrant club life on our campuses. And how can we do that while still making sure that uh, all of our students are safe and our staff members are safe. So that that is one of the things course that our uh, task force and our community will all need to work together and will be part of a continuing conversation here at board level. Developing social emotional support systems uh, is incredibly important. Uh, schools are a place where students socialize. That's what they do. It's part of their uh, maturation. It is part of their emotional growth. It is part of uh, the joy and the, the growth experienced in school. And this new normal will have an impact. And our goal is to make sure that we have school-based mental health services, that there is outreach by our counselors and our school psychologists, that uh, there are support systems in place and families remain engaged and uh, that we partner in supporting practices and that we um, support our staff members because uh, we like to collaborate. We like going across the hall and checking with our um, colleagues about how to best teach X, Y, or Z. And, and we'll need to come up with new ways through which to do that in a different environment and uh, make sure that, that those discussions, whether formal or informal, continue because that is really part of the um, the extraordinary magic that occurs in classrooms and when teaching. And, you know, we have lots of, of great traditions. Today was one of them during this board meeting. We uh, recognize our um, retirees for all that they have contributed. And, and still, we want to do more because uh, it, it is that personal touch 
that makes Monrovia a unique place to, to live, work, and learn. And uh, family and community engagement is yet another one of those uh, areas that we need to pay particular attention to and make sure that uh, we have an effective communication system. We learned in February that we did not, which is why Parent Square came on board. And now we have what we believe will be a, a communication system that works in our classroom with our classroom teachers and with our principals and then broader at the district level. We wanna make sure to continue to provide opportunities where we are discussing and communicating and engaging our stakeholders and our community partners. As we develop operations, we need to look at what our facilities look like. Um, Connie and her team are already looking at uh, plexiglass uh, dividers or uh, in the reception areas of our schools just to create uh, barriers and ensure safety. But this does have a budgeting impact. And uh, it also has an impact on human resources. As we change our operations, as we have fewer students on campus, uh, we have childcare issues. How are we going to help address that? We need uh, more human resources, not less, uh, in some care cases. Nutrition services, I, I think you'll all agree, has been a really uh, a, a shining star during this difficult time. They have served as a beacon at, from each of our schools and served this community uh, so faithfully. And I am so thankful to uh, Alicia and the entire food services team for doing such an extraordinary job and for Connie being that motor behind it, making sure that uh, resources are available and a plan is in place to, to meet the needs. Transportation may change if we have a staggered start, for example, or if we have um, operationally, we will look different and we will need to uh, establish some different practices and, and especially in terms of sanitation between loads of students. And of course, you see that we're already working towards uh, a, our uh, technology infrastructure and make sure that that is uh, an area where we can uh, rely because reliable uh, technology at this point is the key to ensuring the communication and the learning. So there are some operational alternatives that we should also consider. Uh, do we wanna postpone the start of school? Uh, I, learned, I read an article yesterday where a Notre Dame is considering uh, starting school early in order to finish by Thanksgiving, which is flu season. And that was another idea uh, uh, brought up by the board about considering uh, the break between uh, Thanksgiving and traditionally flu season. Maybe we extend it, extending the school year modifying the daily schedule so that perhaps we have uh, block schedules and large, uh, extended breaks to allow for sanitation before the next group of students uh, return. Uh, staggering arrival and missile times. This is, um, this is a really nice practice and one that I've seen uh, done in, in many of our schools. Uh, Brown's did a, did a nice job with this last year where students follow their teacher the next year. So imagine if you're a second grade student and uh, the teacher nope, with whom you had bonded during second um, grade becomes your third grade teacher as well. So those students with their teacher. This isn't always um, ideal, but it's a nice way to meet the social emotional needs of our students as well. You know, what, and it, it's not a certain that. promising practice, but not yeah, she's a widespread. She's locked out. And then, of course, uh, I didn't find so. Uh, um, can I interrupt you for a minute? Yes. Am I the only person that is hearing another person talking? I'm hearing a dog. 
I'm hearing a dog hear conversation as well. Uh, Charles, are you here? What, what I'm, 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 here. I'm, I'm, look, I'm looking for it. I'm okay. looking for it. I thought maybe it's, it was uh, color three. Yeah. Color three is. Okay. Um, because I'm, I'm having difficulty focusing on you. So forgive me for interrupting you. Oh, no problem. I was hoping to ignore it. I thought I couldn't tell from the screen whether or not. Um, well, anyway, I'm, I'm glad it stopped. Uh, should I just keep moving on? Or unless there are any questions from what I might have said thus far. Um, please, please. Okay. All right. Uh, the, we also want to make sure to provide distance learning alternatives. Uh, some of our students will not be able to come back to our schools, they, they, whether it's a compromised immune system or for, for whatever for reason. Um, you know, safety is paramount and uh, distance learning is a viable alternative for our students. So uh, one of the things that I believe uh, Board Member Lockerbie mentioned was Canyon Oaks, oh, excuse me, Mountain Park School, uh, our independent study school where it is the entire format is distance learning and can we rely upon Mountain Park to be that vehicle through which more of our students are served while still enjoying uh, their life on campus in other ways. So again, uh, many outside the box uh, possibilities will be needing to do some creative thinking in order to uh, come up with uh, viable alternatives for all of our students because all of our students are not the same. And so we want to make sure to provide them with uh, opportunities that are unique to each of them and meet their unique needs. Uh, one of the interesting thing comments that I did notice in the, uh, in my quick glance at the survey was how many of our students want to return to class. I don't think many of them would have said exactly that back in February, but they do want to return and boy, do our teachers want them back. So by looking at uh, the guidelines and taking into consideration uh, what we know works in terms of student learning, we are going to develop a template that works and we will be reimagining education for the Monroe Unified School District. This work will begin in earnest uh, once we finish strong, once we uh, close uh, for the year on June 3rd. And we just wanna make sure that everybody stays safe. Thank you. Uh, before Ed, and I just saw that it said Ed left, but I see you, so I'm assuming you have not. <laughs> Well, it comes and goes because the internet service up here is not great, but uh, yeah, I'm back. Okay. I have a couple There's of questions. Do you want to Brian say Mom's time? voice left. <laughs> <laughs> hey, a lot of people have my voice to leave. <laughs> Thank you for that in-depth look. I know that staff has spent an incredible amount of time trying to guess what our future is going to look like. And it's a Herculean effort considering the fact that there is so much information coming from so many different avenues. And so to be able to keep the eye on where it is that you want to get to is um, admirable. Thank you. Um, and like everything else in 2020, this too is all subject to change as the rules change and we need to adapt to that. I think the number one question that I've been asked, and I'm sure you guys are beginning the same thing is, A, when are we going back to school? And I keep giving them the, the date that we have on the calendar. And what is going back to school look like? And the more that we can articulate what that looks like, I think it'll calm a lot of the anxiety that's out in the community right now that it's so, it would be sooner rather than later 
that we can adopt um, what that looks like, at least be able to articulate what our plan looks like out in the public and get it out there in as many different uh, places that we can. Uh, it, it's it's got to be more than the five of us communicating to the people that we talk to. But we need to get out in front into the public where and hopefully if we can by the end of school so that we can arm our parents with that information prior to them leaving our campuses. That, that is the number one thing that I hear about without exception. Um, those are my comments. Anybody else? I, go I go have ahead. a couple and of I questions. He's got this. comments on this one. So go ahead, Maritza. I, I just, you know, I, I sat through this. I've, I've read a lot with the recommendations that the CDC gave and then also what LACO put out and, and your beautiful document that you put together at, for Monrovia Unified. And, all I can think of is the emotional well-being of our students when it comes to the new school year and what and what those guidelines are going to do. I mean, we're talking about mask wearing. We're talking about kids not being able to be, you know, function as kids do. They can't play on a playground together. They, you know, I, I read something where they would have one ball to or one toy <laughs> per student and it's assigned to them and then you you spoke about the supplies and desks facing forward and hallways are all only going in one direction teachers are already challenged this is going to increase their challenges tenfold it is going to be constant johnny don't get don't get close to to sam don't you know don't touch each other don't you can't go there together. You you can't go to the library. You I mean, there's gonna be a lot of you can't, you can't, you can't, and don't, and don't, and don't. And I'm wondering what that is going to do to our children. I think the older ones will have a better understanding, but the young ones, this is going to be a difficult situation. And I really think we need to think about when we start and how we start and what what the ramifications are going to be for these children down the line whenever we get to that phase five i mean this is this is really going to be tough um I, I just want to put that out there because my daughter she's going to start high school and she'll be okay but there's a lot of little kids out there a lot of little kids where it's really going to affect them just needed to say that. There's a there's a number of things, you know, Kathy, and I think everybody feels your pain on this. There are so many balls that are in the air. There are so many plates that are spinning, and nobody really knows which ball we're supposed to be focusing on, and each one has a dramatic consequence. You know, so taking taking a bigger picture from this. Um, I think we've all heard from parents and they all have probably pretty similar concerns of when are they going to go back, what's it going to look like, how are things going to change. And the other aspects are how the distance learning is going currently. So I'm really interested to see in what those surveys look like. Um, but I think also, I, I know I hear from parents who hear from other parents on what they're doing and why don't we do that? Why don't we have teachers who are live streaming their classes? Why don't we have more structure? Uh, because a lot of the kids are really suffering and the parents don't know how to provide the structure for their kids to say, you're up at eight, you go to school till 12, if they just get a worksheet that says, this is what you need to do for the week. I think teachers are struggling. How do they communicate with, with all of the students equally, not just the people who aren't showing up, so to speak. I think there's accountability issues of how do we make sure that there's an equity that all the students are getting the same level quality uh, education. You know, so, and I know you're working on all of these things. Um, 
but the things that I think that we have to uh, we have to get out there in some manner. Pa parents need to have something to hang their hat on on what the school year is going to look like and when it's going to go. And I know we have a lot of question marks, but my biggest questions are going to be um, on structure, meaning what is our timeline? When is our drop dead date? When are we going to say with confidence, we've looked at the 27 different possibilities of how to do things, but on this date, it's done. It's a done deal. And maybe it may change at some point in time in the future, but this is how we're going to start the school year. And this is what's going to happen to make that change. And I, I'm getting concerned that is there's so many possibilities of how to do this that by the time we get to the point where we decide what we're going to do, uh, there's going to be no time for feedback. Uh, and in the meantime, parents are going to go other places. I think everybody is, has the same concern, and, and you had even mentioned it, right? 33% of the people want to come back to school, but that means 67% of, of the people don't want to come back to school on a full-time basis. How are we going to address that? I mean, the funding is a completely different question. We know it's going to be very much impacted, but I, I would love to be able to say and tell people, show show them the PowerPoint or have it have it up so they know what we're looking at, what we're confronted with, and say, on this particular day, we will tell you exactly how this is going to roll out. And we have to have that because we have to have uh, enough lead time for the teachers to know what's going on, uh, for all the unions to agree on what's going to happen, and to deal with the fallout of our staff members who are not comfortable with it, who say, you know what, I, I, can't, I can't teach in that environment, and so we need to go out and get replacements. Uh, or if the days change because they're staggered and we have to change those rules. I, I think there are so many uh, life-changing events that are gonna occur from this opening that we have to pick a date, even if we know it's not necessarily gonna be the best choice, but we gotta start building around something. We have to be able to start getting input from all of the stakeholders, students, parents, teachers, principals, to say, I'm on board with this, this is the best way, here are my two cents, please incorporate it if you can. Uh, I, I just think we're at a point where we have so many choices, it's hard to get your arms around it. And it's hard to, to, to really get behind what's going on. And it's easier just to say, you know what, I, I'm gonna go over here because I, I know what it is. I don't think it's the best thing in the world, but I know what it is. You know, the known evil type of, of mentality. Uh, I think we will do everybody, and, and I, I don't know if you have a date in mind, but I, I would love it if we can put it out there to everybody uh, so there could be some certainty. I mean, I think part of the problem of the, this pandemic and everybody getting stuck at home is the level of uncertainty. Uh, we know what the uncertainty part is and bringing some certainty back, I think is very reassuring. So that would be my big, my big question. Uh, other than some of the, the practical aspects of if you're doing social spacing in a classroom, how many desks can you actually put in our classrooms, in our elementary classrooms? I, I mean, that in itself, that may eliminate all kinds of options from a practical standpoint, because if we can only put in 15 desks or 10 desks and we've got 30 kids, we've got a problem. I mean, we need to either triple our teaching staff or just from practical limitations, we've got to do something dramatically different, right? So these are the things um, that I, I think that if we can gravitate to even a top two choices, in, uh, that would be really helpful for all parties involved. That That's... All I got, trying not to add too much to your plate, but.
that's what's important to me, I think. One of the things, oh, sorry. Oh, I just, you, you look like you wanted to say something. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that I think was important in your presentation was your use of the word agile as making sure that your um, task force is agile so they can move quickly because you know we're we're sort of creating best practices right now we're 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 creating the different pedagogy um, and it's got to change it, it's got to have the potential to be able to change very quickly um, based on whatever we're faced with and pretty much to add on to what Brian said um, you know I I I need to know what I'm going to do with my kids and that it's three months away which is going to go like that because no one's going away on vacation I'm going to be at home thinking about what's happening with my kids so yes Brian thank you we, we need to know what's going to happen as soon as possible. And that task force needs to be able to adapt quickly. So maybe they say, okay, this is it. This is what we've got. And then something changes because we all know that things change um, day by day. So they need to be able to change and adapt very quickly and get that communication out. Um, and then one of the things that, nah, I won't talk about that. <laughs> Um, what I'd like to know is you had a whole page of alternatives, different ideas that your task force is considering about um, distance, about learning. What alternatives need to be negotiated with unions? Uh, the start days, date, or the change of the calendar, certainly. So uh, any calendar change needs to be negotiated? So do you have, does it, does, is the task force comprised of union reps or is the task force going to come up with something and then bring it to the union or, or how is that going to work? Because this all needs to happen very quickly. And I know negotiations can sometimes take some time, take some time. How, how, how so, are we? I, the discussions that will occur um, with just internally with the task force will then need to go out. And really, we have not begun focusing on this just yet. I want you to know that our entire focus has been in the last two months on making sure that kids had everything they need to the best of our ability and that we provided them both acknowledgement of achievement as well as enrichment opportunities and support. And I am proud of the work that this team has done to date. And but I that, think, I think that you has, should be. That has taken our entire focus. Uh, the challenge for next year is different than the challenge for this year. This year, we had uh, relationships already established between teacher and student, for example, that were able to extend through uh, the dismissal. Uh, next year, it's a whole new beginning. So the discussions that will occur at the elementary and at the secondary level will be about what will work best for kids. And that conversation is not neither quick nor easy, requires research. And there are lots of um, different uh, experiments going on right now all over the world. Just look at it, uh, look for it, and you will find lots of different ways where schooling is occurring. I have no intention of experimenting with monogamous children. What we will do will be thoughtful, it will be uh, research-based, and it will be based upon the strengths of our organization and what we believe will be in the best interest of children, and will need to be flexible. So what that looks like, 
Uh, if I knew today, not only would I be sharing it with everybody, I would be uh, sharing it with my colleagues up and down the state of California, because this is not an answer anybody has today. The Cal States came up with an answer, distance learning in the fall. That is not our answer. That's an easy answer, but that is not our answer. Our answer is going to be, uh, will likely have every one of those three models comprised within it. So it will have options for our parents. Uh, but again, it needs to be flushed out. And so when the conversations occur internally, they will need to go out. Does this work? Uh, how would this work operationally? Can we get sanitation done between uh, periods? Can we get the instruction done? Uh, do we really need, uh, we won't have 30 desks in any class, but neither would we need it on any one day if we have a portion of our students uh, learning uh, remotely. So again, the survey we took was kind of a temperature check of what is the interest and the interest is wide, which means that the uh, plans that we develop will need to meet each one of those three kind of groups and interests. And that's a great starting point, but we'll need to get into specifics as well with families so that I can ask Celine Lockerbie mom, hey, here are, here are the couple of options, which would work best for your children? Uh, and keeping in mind that this is a limited time because with any luck, we will go back to normal, uh, you know, with phase five uh, sooner rather than later. But we are planning for the long term, which is why everything we've done has been systematic and thoughtful and inclusive up until this point. What we have with the MOUs that were accepted today and developed with our uh, associations will serve as a baseline for tomorrow. They will need to be modified, but they will serve as a baseline. So continuing with those regular conversations, bringing this back, uh, board member Wong asked for, I need a date. When's it gonna be done? <laughs> and uh, I, uh, is that how I'm going really phrase my question? What is the last possible date that you can start with a plan? I mean, you can't, let's pick the absurd, right? You can't say on the first day of school, here's what's gonna happen, right? There has to be a point in time in which you say, the teachers need to know, parents need to know, students need to know, and here is the last possible time we have to roll this out. And I don't know when that date is. And I'm sure you don't either, because like you said, there's a lot of things that are going on, but it would be helpful to know what that last cutoff date, point of no return is, we have to go with the plan. Good or bad, we have to go with the plan. So let me just say that this presentation will be a, a recurring role in board meetings from now on with <laughs> updates from the task force. I mean, if that's the first answer you want is what's the last possible date, we can certainly start with that. Um, but there's a lot for us to discuss. We will have more information as we begin this process. And let me emphasize, we are beginning this process. We'll have more than a weekend to turn this around. That's what we did the last time. I'd like to be able to give this a little more thought than what we did, and we did it pretty well. But Dr. Thorosian, about what right. percentage of um, our parents responded to that survey? Exactly what I was going to ask. <laughs> I I, I want to say somewhere between uh, 10 and 15 percent. I'm not sure. Okay. And then the next thing is on that survey, uh, I'd like to get a copy of, of the questions and answers. I mean, we saw yeah. the, 
but I would like to see how that mapped out. Right. You'll have that uh, in this week's update. Uh, and, you know, I said 10 or 15%. I should have kept my mouth shut. For all I know, it's 50% in some schools and much less than others. So, again, I guess those you know, numbers, that would be, I think that would be helpful for us. Yeah. Yeah. So, you'll have um, the numbers by school and you'll have the numbers by group because we, we, um, surveyed parents, teachers, and students. Okay. Now, well, I want to uh, give you guys uh, kudos because you guys have done a yeoman's job. I mean, this is kind of like trying to describe an elephant you've never seen and can't, can't even touch the whole thing. And, and we want to know exactly what an elephant looks like. Well, it's going to be a while before we can figure all that out. But this, so far, this district has been a leader in how to make this transition and how to do it. And that's because of your leadership and because of what's been done here. And it's great. And I, I think you're on the right path. I, I do think there has to be a drop dead date when we say we've got to have a plan by such and such a date if we're going to be ready for opening. Now, I've got a couple of questions about how that might look. And one is, are there classes, especially, I mean, primarily in the secondary level, uh, video production is one that comes to my mind. Is that just gonna be too complicated to even have that kind of a class next year? Because, uh, you know, there's only a limited amount of equipment for all the students to use. And can it be adequately sanitized? Who makes that decision? Is that the teacher and the principal? Or is this committee going to get involved in that level of discussion? Uh, if we can't provide a set of art supplies for each student, are we going to have to ask the parents to provide art supplies? Or are we just not going to be able to offer art? And there is a million questions like that before you confirm up some of this. But uh, do you think there will be certain classes or certain subjects that uh, uh, we're just going to have to say we're going to skip it this year because economically we can't we can't do what's needed to keep our students safe. And I got a couple of questions on athletics too. But what's your gut feeling on that, Dr. T? I I I would say that I would fight to keep our programs going, and we'd find a way to do it. Uh, is it a possibility? Of course it is. Uh, would it be? Okay. Uh, would I um, work every angle in order to keep the programs going? Absolutely. And I think we have enough. Okay, but at some at some point, these kids are going to have to register, so they'll have to know if every class is going to be offered or not. So right, I'm just right. It just raises some red flags for me that in order to keep everything going, we may be incurring some costs that are unrealistic. Yeah, my other question has to do with athletics. And uh, uh, I assume that Randy Bell is still our, uh, our contact with CIF. And my question is CIF keeping him in the loop? And are we gonna have any say as a district? And is, is Randy the one that's gonna have that say as to what is acceptable to us for CIF to come out with uh, rules and guidelines for next year's athletic program. I, uh, I know that uh, the Rio, Rio Honda League has already discussed this is what are, um, what are the variables and how are we gonna move forward with athletics? What, um, what decisions are there gonna be made? Uh, I also had a conversation with CIF um, because this has been on my mind as well. Uh, we want to make sure that our kids are safe and conditioned and ready for competition. Uh, and uh, so in my conversation with uh, my contact at CIF, I, I asked what kind of leadership, what kind of guidance are we going to get? And uh, the response I received helped me better understand uh, CIF's role. CIF establishes baseline who uh, who is eligible, you know, a level playing field of who is eligible to compete in athletics. Uh, 
they also determine the brackets for postseason and uh, the the elements of play in postseason. But during the season, it is up to every district to determine whether or not they're going to continue. So that's a but district. CIF determines when the season is going to start and who can start practicing when. And I, I'm just wondering if, if Randy has a seat at the table or we're just going to have to go with whatever CIF comes well, up with. Um, CIF is not going to interfere is what I'm telling you. It, at least that is the understanding. If real So they're not going to say when we can start practicing? Well, I think they've always a, said when the school start practicing. They've always said when the season's going to end. I mean, that's are, part of what that's part of how they set the tournament. And I don't know. They change in what they're doing. They have set a traditional schedule each year. Uh, this year, they are not going to interfere with what the Department of Public Health says in terms of contact. And let's start with fall. We have football starting, and that's a contact sport. So, uh, you know, we don't have uh, a way to keep them six feet apart and still tackle. Uh, it doesn't happen that way. Now, if as a Rio Honda League, we decided to push the season back, we, we have every right to do so. How that impacts postseason and preseason is a whole different story. And, we all, and uh, CF isn't getting involved in that at this time. So I'll keep you posted, but there's a lot more. They're just kicking the can down the road. So CIF isn't they're going to determine when the season starts. They're going to defer to the district. They're going to defer to the league. To, uh, well, the district, the district, Monrovia Unified School District can decide. Um, you know what? We are not going to start football season this year. We didn't have uh, a chance to do the conditioning in the spring, and uh, we're not going to have a chance to do the conditioning in the summer. That's a that's not going to be a choice that CIF is going to make. It's going to be a choice that Monrovia Unified School District can make. And by the way, the only way we would be able to make it is um, if suddenly the Department of Public Health said, we're open. You know, that's a, if I, uh, it, just referring back to the Department of Public Health, that's a phase four. And we're still in phase two. So, so uh, we're talking about so, so that, that we would have to be in phase four for there to be practices, for there to be conditioning to enable athletics. the season to start. Mm -hmm. What I think Ed is referring to is, I mean, CIF, definitely sets the beginnings and they set the rules because last year they set soccer schedules that were really bizarre, had weekend games and so forth. So, so all of the, all of the different leagues would finish at the same time and there wouldn't be such a big gap throughout the state for the, for the various playoff games. Uh, football was the same way. Um, and, and I think that these decisions may not be CIF per se, but they're definitely Rio Hondo League decisions because Rio Hondo is the one, all of the schools within that league make the determination of what they want to do. Because I was talking to Randy about this before on some of the scheduling. So it would be interesting to hear if the county says it's up to you what you want to do, which is I'm sure they're going to do somewhere along the line. Uh, and as a league, um, we're going to have to make a decision. And, and Randy clearly is our spokesperson for this uh, and is our seat at the table as to what's going on. It would be, it would be good to, for us to know um, what those conversations have been to date. We understand things are going to change. But if they haven't even had a conversation about this yet, that's one thing. So I don't know how we could possibly be uh, allowing students to uh, register for seventh period, sixth period PE for football if we know we're not going to have a football season, for example. 
I don't know if that's very responsible on our part. I mean, at some point in time, we have to make a decision as a district to say, fall sports are, are a bust, don't register for it, right? I'm thinking, or, or I could be wrong. Well, I think part of the reason it's uh, prudent to wait for those decisions is to see it, what are the possibilities, because again, it's a changing landscape. Rio Hondo League has begun the conversation, but they are not anywhere near a place to, to present and, and explain anything or, or say anything. I'm not sure what the conversation, and I do not want to put myself in a position where I'm saying, speaking on behalf of CIF, that is irresponsible of me. I've had one conversation with one individual and shared one perception, one perspective. But you know, that is absolutely part of what we need to consider as we move forward. Because in the big picture, yeah. this, this isn't probably the most important of things. The, the question just, and this is a generalized question, is has Randy had conversations and where does it look like from the conversation that he's had just so we can have a feel for what's going on? Because it would be great to know as I'm, we're talking to parents and they say, should my kid take football or should he take biology instead? Because there's no season for us to be able to say, you know, no decision has been made, but they're leaning this way, or this is what their topics of conversations are, or this is what their timelines are to make to make a call. Um, so if we can just get an update from Randy in your next uh, update, just generalization of where things are, that would help me. I think we lost Ed. We did. Uh, um, Dr. Terosian, on those task forces, um, task force, you had one for uh, K through five and then one for the secondary schools? Yes. Right. The stakeholders at the table for those task group, task force groups, are there any parents on those task force groups or is it all personnel? It's all personnel at this point. What can okay. we do? What is our capacity as an organization? All right. So the only feedback at this point from parents or opportunity for feedback from parents has been through this survey, mm -hmm. Hope, hoping that the numbers are higher. But if it's only 10 to 15 percent of parents mm -hmm. input, is there another opportunity to get more input? Now that a lot of the information has come out from LACO, from CDC, you know, they might even have changed their mind. Is there another opportunity for feedback from parents? Yes. So one of the things that I think I mentioned about the task force was that it would be an accordion process and we would need to uh, continually communicate with our uh, community partners. The PTA, for example, is one of our most, uh, you know, trustworthy uh, partners. There are people upon whom I, I rely and whose judgment I appreciate. Uh, as part of this task force, it would be inappropriate because they don't understand the capacity of our people and what needs to happen. And so that's why we're starting small internally. We'll need to branch out, seek input, get some additional information, perhaps start some subgroups. I don't know. But the idea of communicating regularly and seeking input regularly is part of it. Uh, it there will need to be a point by which we finish. And so in order to get there, what will it take? Uh, that is going to be all part of our discussion as we as we begin this process. Dr. Okay. Rosen, there was another, um, it, it's not a survey, but it's the end of the year, um, are you coming back to school questionnaire. Yeah. How, how many of our parents have responded to that? I will find that out. Uh, yes, I don't expect you to have that number on the on the top of you, but that would be interesting to see how many people responded to that versus how many people responded to this other survey. 
and the results and and the results of that a lot of work ahead of, of all of you and all of us yeah this is <laughs> I, I think now anybody who's been watching this will know the depth of how much work has been going on since we left school and what we knew in March. We are truly in uncharted territory. And it's an unfortunate, we don't get to make the rules up for ourselves. We have to wait for somebody else to make a rule that we respond to. And they change constantly. Anyway, um, thank you very much, Dr. Tarosi. Anybody else have any more comments? If, if, if you could, Kathy, I, I, there's been a lot of dialogue and I know there's a lot of in-depth, but I think it's really important for the community to understand all that's been going on. And if you could just put it in, try to frame it and, and put it out to, the public in one of your uh, formats. I think it'd be very, very beneficial. Um, I, I don't know if anybody really knows the depth of which you guys have been working trying to figure this thing out. I know it's frustrating on all of our parts, you know, because we want to have the answers to it. Nobody wants uncertainty and certainly nobody wants to create any more anxiety for anybody else. There's plenty without us uh, contributing to it. And the, the, the answer of, I don't know, may be perfectly acceptable, but it, it sure doesn't reduce anxiety any anyway. <laughs> So if we could do that, that would probably be a very good thing. I, that has actually been my um, plan for uh, the next communication. First with our staff, you know, th this is the team upon whom we rely to make whatever we develop come together. They're, they're, they are our hope. Uh, and so presenting and sharing uh, the, the process with them as well as uh, keeping them informed is really critical. Uh, and then of course with our community because this is the, the big thing, you know, other than graduations and promotions, which are also, you know, celebrations and culminations of opportunities. This is the next thing. And, and we want to be able to at least have people be able to refer to information and, and see that there is work going on behind the scenes, though there is no yet um, proof from that label. Well, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, we're gonna move on to pending board issues. Dr. Sherosian. In pending board issues, uh, what I do want to mention is that there have been some updates, um, but in terms of uh, legislative policy, what we have done is sent out a letter to our state representatives. And this is what uh, Mr. Wong had referenced earlier regarding uh, flexibility. Uh, advocating for areas where flexibility would not necessarily cost the state of California any additional money, but it would save us some. So whether it's the amount that we are required to place in the restrictive maintenance account, or whether it's um, you know, the, the stirs and purrs uh, employee contributions, and whether that can be uh, remain stagnant or reduced for a limited period of time. There, there are several things that we identified and we sent out um, on behalf of the board and the district to state legislators. Uh, on Friday morning, I've been in, invited to uh, a discussion, a virtual discussion with uh, several of my colleagues up and down. Um, there are perhaps eight of us, eight or 10 of us, uh, will be on the call with Senator Portantino and the Department of Finance. So, and, and the governor's office in order to share our views. And what I, I have done already is shared some of those concepts that the board has already discussed about flexibility so that 
uh, to make sure that those are on the table as we discuss uh, the budget on Friday morning. I hope to have some more information for you um, Friday afternoon, or uh, certainly I will have some by the board meeting. And uh, we have, uh, I wanna take a minute to also commend uh, John Russell, who has uh, pulled together a very challenging uh, grant and, uh, for the Bureau of Justice Administration. And we will have uh, a very competitive grant to submit, thanks to uh, our partners from Churches and Associates who have, uh, the law, our lobbyists uh, who have uh, gathered letters of support, which will absolutely make this a very competitive uh, grant application. And so I am uh, continuing to hope for the best uh, in this arena, and this is for uh, school safety as well. So uh, that is uh, my update regarding uh, pending board issues. Any questions of Kathy? Ed, are you saying something? Well, I was, but apparently I was muted. Uh, I was just asking Kathy not to forget to put that distance learning uh, uh, board policy on the review calendar. Yes. Thank on you. pending board issues. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions or any comments? Okay. Moving on. Um, I made a dreadful error at the beginning of the meeting this evening. Um, I was supposed to do something. I'm going to do it now. Um, the, the meeting tonight was done in honor of Callahan Dax Kaiser. And if Miss Husk, we, if we have a picture. There oh he is. God. Uh, came in the world on May the 20th at eight pounds, 1.5 ounces. And this is the grandchild of Sue and Greg Kaiser or Dr. Sue and Dr. Greg Kaiser. And I'm so sorry, I, well, if I don't incorporate my paperwork from other avenues, I, I miss things. And I realized about 30 minutes into the meeting that I was supposed to do something. So here's what I was supposed to do at the very beginning. Congratulations. Congratulations. Very cool. And I sure hope, I, 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 I hope Sue knows that we did do that and it was no malice on my part for, although I happen to think that my grandchildren may be the most beautiful grandchildren ever. <laughs> I understand why Sue might be biased on her own. Oh, oh there she is. <laughs> <laughs> so adorable. This was, not, this was not grandchildren war, Sue. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> Um, our next regularly scheduled board meeting will be virtual uh, on June the 10th at 7 p.m. Uh, the other one will be on June the 24th at 7 p.m. There are some important dates that are coming up uh, for promotions and graduations. The CELC on May 29th, 4, uh, Brad Oaks Elementary, uh, and, uh, Mayflower Elementary, and Plymouth are going to be on June the 3rd at different times in the morning. So. If you have any questions, call your school. And uh, Wild, Wild Rose will be on June the 1st. Clifton will be on June the 1st and 2nd. Santa Fe will be on June the 1st and 2nd. And MHS, I'm sorry, and I'm missing somebody in here because I need Canyon. Canyon will be on the 2nd. And MHS will be on June the 3rd between 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Summer school will start. Um, from uh, K through eight, from July 6th through July 31st. High school will be going from June the 11th to July the 15th. And it will be both, all, both those will be online. There will be credit recovery as well as enrichment um, opportunities. So please take advantage of that. If anybody has any questions, please look at our website, www.moraviaschools.net or call your school. Um, Last day of school is going to be on June the 3rd. Um, that will be the official last day of school. And if we have no further business before this body, we will stand adjourned.